All right, hello everyone. Let's get started. Today we're going to talk about advanced optimization algorithms for training neural networks. Uh, before we get started, there is one really cool announcement. You probably already know at this point, but we've got by we, I mean the AI community got for the first time a Nobel Prize, or actually two. Um, so yesterday they awarded John Hopfield and uh, Jeff Hinton the Nobel Prize in Physics, which is uh, a really uh, important uh, prize for, for AI and even for computer science as a whole because as you probably know, Nobel Prizes don't go to computer scientists. We don't have a computer science award. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, for the first time we got computer scientists winning um, a Nobel Prize and this time they actually got two. Because today they just announced that also the, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry goes to uh, Demis Hassabis and David Baker and John Humper. If you don't know who Demis Hassabis is, I'm just, he's the CEO of DeepMind. And they got this award for their work on protein structure prediction using AlphaFold, which is an algorithm based on reinforcement learning. And Hopfield and Hinton, they were awarded because of their um, huge contributions to the field of machine learning, especially by training artificial neural networks. And there has been some discussion around this. How come like, a, a physics prize goes to a computer scientist and how, why does it mean, or what does it mean for, for, for the field, for both physics and computer science? What does this mean, right? Does it mean that physics is running out of ideas and is actually uh, is using computer science to solve problems? Or maybe for computer science, maybe for us, this means that we're gonna start entering the field of the basic sciences, maybe. Maybe actually computer science is not a mean to achieve uh, or to answer the, the deeper questions of the universe, but maybe it's actually a, one of the basic uh, scientific fields that might be actually now becoming as important as maybe physics and chemistry or something. So there's a really nice debate going on on the web about this. Uh, and it's really recent. So we got this yesterday and, and today. So it's a huge uh, moment for, for AI. And just as a joke, tomorrow is the Nobel Prize. They're going to give the award for the Literature Prize, right? And maybe ChatGPT might win this time, so. <laughs> okay, jokes aside, our announcements for today are first, well, our next class is going to be Monday and we're going to have the midterm. So for those of you who are here, this is going to be in, in the lab, and you're going to take the exam on the computer. Okay? Obviously, you can bring a piece of paper. You can, um, if you want to do calculations, you can use a piece of paper to do your math, and I'm still deciding if you can use a, a cheat sheet or not for this assignment, for this uh, exam. Okay? In Florestal, it's going to be very similar. Uh, the idea is that you're going to go to the lab, you're going to open Moodle and take the assignment there. Uh, and our second programming assignment is due tonight, okay, at 11.59. So I don't want you to keep working uh, the end of this week because you should be studying to the exam, for the exam, okay? And also you, you, you have to uh, spend time on your project proposals. So I don't want you to, to uh, spend extra time implementing your MLP. Last time we were talking about regularization. Specifically we talked about L1 and L2 regularization. And then we talked about drop, dropout and early stopping and data augmentation. Just one quick comment about reg these, the differences between these techniques, specifically about L1, L2 versus dropout. Right? 
If you notice, L1 and L2 regularization, they simplify the models by changing the loss function. In other words, they don't change the models directly. And dropout is the opposite. It actually changes the model, but doesn't change the loss function. Okay. But there's different ways of regularize a model. <clears throat> and then early stopping and data augmentation, they are uh, other simpler approaches. One early stopping is you just uh, analyze your learning curves and check uh, what is the moment in the training phase that you get the best uh, validation error. And da data augmentation is just generating synthetic data out of your original samples in your data set. Okay, for today, we're gonna talk about variations of gradient descent. So far we've been using this, uh, let's say, basic version of gradient descent that uses the entire data set for computing the gradients and then updating the weights. But you'll see that um, for large data sets, that's unfeasible because they don't fit in, the whole, in your memory. You, for real life problems in deep learning, you won't be able to fit your entire data set at once and then compute the gradients with vectorization for that entire data set. So for that reason, nowadays we use mini batch gradient descent um, way more frequently than we use the basic or we call the batch gradient descent. After that, we'll see gradient descent with momentum uh, that uses this idea of exponential moving averages. So we're gonna have to review that. If, uh, for those of you who have seen this idea before, uh, which is a way of computing averages for time series. And again, the idea here is to speed up the learning process, okay? on top of mini batch. And we're gonna see two different ideas for that. Gradient descent with momentum and RMS prop, which is root mean squared propagation. This is another way, or it's a similar algorithm to gradient descent with momentum that tries to speed up learning um, by, by using different formulations, okay? But they also, both of them use uh, the exponential moving average idea. And then uh, at the very end, I'm gonna introduce the ADAM algorithm, which stands for adaptive moment estimation. And that's the most common algorithm I'm using today, okay, for training neural networks. So remember we were talking uh, about this practice of deep learning where we have to iterate between training and validation, tweaking in our models, uh, either making it bigger, smaller, adding regularization, so in order to achieve a good validation uh, error or performance, right? So this process might take a long time, okay? Especially here, the training phase might take a really long time. If you're dealing with really large data sets, right, that step in fact takes days or can take months. Only one training of, of that, uh, of your model. So a key aspect for deep learning success is making this process as fast as possible. When I say the process, not only the training step, but the whole, uh, iterative training validation um, process. But since training is the part of our pipeline that takes the longest, this is normally where we try to speed up uh, more. So the faster you can train your models, uh, the, the faster you can iterate or tweak your model to get the best performance. So it's, it's key and, and it has been making training faster has been even up to this day a key uh, problem of deep learning, how to make learning faster, 
Okay, that's, uh, that's a key problem in deep learning. And today I'm going to show you some ideas about how to do that. <clears throat> so, as I just said, reducing training time is a crucial factor in creating successful neural network models. So, one thing you've just seen already that makes this um, training process much faster is using vectorization, right? Or taking advan uh, advantage of your GPU and doing vector operations instead of just scalar operations. So, this avoids a bunch of for loops in your code that scales your um, programs a lot, by, by, by a lot. But there's a problem. So far, we've been dealing with very small data sets. Even the cat-dog image uh, data set in the assignment, even though it's a, it's a data set of images, it's a fairly small data set that fits entirely in your memory, so we could run um, gradient descent in a vectorized way. So, in other words, you would have a forward step in your code, you would have something like this, like a forward function that you would pass the entire data set here and you would have, you would get a vector y hat, which was uh, the predictions for all the examples in your x data set, okay? Remember that the X data set has this size, right? It's D by M, where D is your number of input features and M is the number of examples, okay? And this, data, and this vector is one by M, okay? So we have one prediction per example and here I have M examples with D features each. So in small data sets, we can do that. And you're gonna run this function in one, in a few cycles in your GPU or CPU, and you're good to go. And your, fa your code is gonna run much faster. But for large data sets, we won't be able to do that because this X matrix here won't fit entirely in your, in your CPU or GPU. So to solve that problem, we're gonna have to tweak our optimization algorithms a little bit, okay? <clears throat> so that leads us to this idea of mini batch gradient descent, which is a fairly simple idea. So consider a large data set. Let's say we have five million images, which is uh, a common size for today's standards. Right, this data set here, if this X represents five million images, right, it won't fit in your hardware, most likely. <clears throat> so to vectorize, to still use vectorization, we're gonna need to split our data set in what we call mini batches, okay? Which are subsets of our uh, original data set, okay? So, Consider our original data set here, X, which is this vertical bar, where every column here, X, I, is an example, okay? This is our entire data set, uh, plus the labels, right? So for each, for each um, example X or input feature X, we have a label associated. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna split this data set in chunks that we call mini batches. And the size of this mini batch is another hyperparameter of our um, algorithm that we're gonna have to tweak. <clears throat> but you can think, let's say, that for now, I'm gonna call the size of the batches, or the mini batches B, and in this example here, we are seeing a B equals to 32. So you see that, that X1, or capital X, superscript, curly, bra curly brackets one, that uh, denote the first 32 examples in our data set. That's our mini batch number one, okay? 
and also associated with that mini batch, you have 32 uh, Ys, or you have this uh, Y matrix or vector in this case, Y super, superscript curly brackets one, that is your labels for that first mini batch. So basically, you're going to do that for the number of batches that you get, uh, or you're going to do that for the entire data set, right? Which ends up being m over b mini batches, right? Where m is the number of m is the number of examples, so m over b is the number of mini batches we're going to get, right? <clears throat> so that's the whole idea. Actually, this is the whole idea. What we're going to do now is we're going to update the weights of our model for each mini batch instead. OK? So before we are doing one update for the entire data set, and now I'm going to update our model for each of these mini batches. OK? And here is a algorithm, so hopefully this makes it more clear. So first, we're going to compute the number of batches, which is the number of examples divided by the size of the batch. Okay. So if you have m equal to, let's say, a, a thousand, right, and b is equal to a hundred, you're going to have our n batches there is going to be 10. Right? First for loop is our loop of epochs. That's the for loop of the number of iterations of the gradient descent. That stays the same. But now we have a second for loop. Because we're going to process the data set in chunks. So I'm going to have this second for loop for t in range of number of batches. So for each batch in my um, data set, so for each one of these 10 batches in this example, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to call compute the forward pass for each mini batch. So I'm going to I'm going to compute the predictions for x t. And this is going to give me the predictions y hat t. Okay? And then I, I compute now the loss for that particular mini batch. So notice that in that loss computation there, I'm summing the losses for all the y, t, y hat t predictions, and I'm dividing by b, because b is the, the number, of, uh, number of elements in that batch, right? So then I, I do backward pass for this loss, for this loss only, right? So for this first batch. And then I update the weights for that first batch. So now I'm still in that inner loop there. So I go back, now t equals to 1. And I have x1 now. So previously I had x0. Now I have x1. And I do forward pass for x1 to get the predictions of y1. Compute the loss and update the weights. And then I do that for the set for batch number two, batch number three, batch number four. Okay, until batch number 10, if I had that example with b equals to 10. So basically, I am dividing my updates in, in several steps. So I have a large data set, x, I have mini batches, one two, 
into m over b. And for each one of them, I compute the forward pass loss and backward. And I do this again here, and I do this again here. Then I'm done for one epoch. I go back to the outer loop there, and I repeat this process. So that's it. I'm splitting the updates in chunks called mini batches. Is this clear? What's going on here? That's, that's true. I, I actually, that was my bad. I should have called this uh, batch size, maybe. Okay. So in the literature, when you hear batch gradient descent, this means our original gradient descent algorithm that only updates uh, the weights once per epoch. When you see the word stochastic gradient descent, it's a version of mini batch gradient descent where B size is equal to one. So in other words, your batch or mini batch size is a single example. Okay. And what we call the mini batch gradient descent is when B size is between one and N, right? It's normally a small number. Um, B size is normally a small number between one and N. All right, so maybe what I'm gonna show now kind of helps you gain a better intuition of what's going on. Um, first, let's talk about the difference of, on learning curves. If you're training with batch gradient descent, you have only single, one single update per epoch. And more importantly, because you are computing the error on the entire data set, your gradient is exact. So that's the exact gradient you need to um, optimize your function. Or that's the exact direction you have to go to minimize your error as fast as possible. Okay? So because of that, the, the learning curve you get is normally uh, shows this steady monotonic decrease in loss. Okay? So it looks like this curve that is decreasing smoothly uh, because your gradient goes or points to the right direction, okay? If you use mini-batch, now you are approximating your exact gradient. You don't have the exact gradient anymore because you are computing the, the errors on this pad or this chunks. So that chunk doesn't represent the entire data set. So what it does is it approximates um, the, the gradient you need. But because we have a lot of data, that's actually fine, because we're going to end up going to the local minimum that we, need, that we need, and hopefully to the global minimum of error. But it's fine because, because we have a lot of data. right? But it's important to understand here that whenever we compute the gradient using a mini batch, we are computing an approximate gradient. And because of that, our learning curve tends to be more noisy or jagged. Because again, as I said, one mini batch might be easier, and this is a good example, one mini batch might be easier to predict than another. So for example, here I have 500 examples of only once, only once. So here I can predict, if my model predicts only one, it gets this entire mini batch right. But this one is a little bit harder to predict, okay? So if I plot my learning curve for each mini batch, I might get a lower error here and a, lot, and a higher error, error here. So I'm going to see this kind of jagged line that still goes down. Overall, it's going to reach that uh, minimum point. Because again, now we are, it's, this is an approximated algorithm. Okay? But uh, gives us, leads us to uh, the, to minimize the, the loss function just, just, uh, as well as batch gradient descent, okay? So another maybe visual uh, idea is that can help you understand the difference between these algorithms is, is this. Let's look at this 
contour plot of the learning curve, right? So this is my loss function. And this is the global minimum, let's say, of my loss function. And I'm trying to reach there. And here, just for simplicity, imagine I have here, uh, this is W and this is B. Could be the, op the opposite. So I, consider I only have, actually, let's, let's think of B and W. Doesn't, doesn't matter much. Imagine I have just two parameters, and this is my loss function. So in gradient descent, we start at some point here. <clears throat> and if I use batch gradient descent, which processes the entire data set, my gradient, or the, the direction that I get when I compute the gradient using backprop, is exact. So I'm going to take, so this uh, algorithm is going to take me down uh, as fast as possible. OK, obviously, I have to control the learning curve. But this gives me the direct, direct direction that I need to, to, do, to minimize my loss function. Okay. Each of these gradient computes, they are performed on the entire X data set. OK? And I have a single update for each, each epoch. <clears throat> but keep in mind, these are slower steps, in a way, because Again, I'm, I'm now assuming that this data set doesn't fit in my memory. So to compute this vector here, I'm going to have to process the entire data set. Imagine that x has 5 million images again. I would have to process all these 5 million images to get this vector here. Okay, so it's a much slower algorithm. On the other end of the spectrum, we have stochastic gradient descent, which does one update per example. So it's hard to draw this, but now I'm computing one of these, one gradient per x, per, per example. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to be very noisy updates, because I'm computing the error, error for each example, and that's a very bad approximate, approximation of this vector here. Okay. <clears throat> but in other words, but again, but this is only one x. This is only one x, x1. So it's much faster to compute this approximation. Each of these steps I can do much faster than this step here. Okay? So it's a benefit in a way. So I can run, let's say if I have five seconds of compute, I can do uh, much more updates than I can do here. But these updates are kind of noisy. They might take me to the wrong direction. But I can do just more steps per time. Okay? And, but one downside is that I am not using vectorization here because I'm processing every example once at a time. Okay. I'm going to have to do a for loop anyways for each example. So I have to process 5 million examples independently. And you can think of mini batch gradient descent, which is the most common approach in deep learning nowadays, as kind of a hybrid between these two. Now I have a vectorized implementation that I can process chunks of the entire data set of size 32, for example. They are not perfect gradients, but they are better approximations than the batch gradient descent. So I'm going to get down a little faster, maybe going uh, 
actually, to be more accurate, I would need more steps here. Sorry. Probably going to take more steps here than, than for batch grain and descent. And here you would take even more. But all of them would kind of, in the long run, take you to the minimum. This one probably will take more steps. This one will take last steps. And this one is going to be in between. OK? My hand drawing is not great, so I, I do have it. I do have them here for you. OK? So batch gradient descent is in green. So see how the uh, gradients, they point to this direction of minimum descent, right? So you take last steps to get to minimum, but each step is more computationally intensive. Stochastic gradient descent in blue, it's very noisy. It takes each step is very quick to process, but it, it takes you to even very wrong directions. And mini batch is a good hybrid approach between the two. Question. So a couple of ideas about choosing batch size. I think this is related to uh, the last question. So if you have a small data set, just use batch grain descent, right? You can feed your entire data set in memory. You're going to get uh, exact gradients. So there's no need uh, for, for mini batch grain descent. But if you are in a large data set regime, then yeah, then you're going to need this. Otherwise, I mean, you, it's going to be very clear. Once you have a gigantic data set in, in, in hand, if you're going to try to run a simple grain descent, it won't run. You're going to wait forever, and you won't get a prediction. <laughs> you're going to see that right away. So then your option is mini batch grain descent. And that gives us a, different, a new hyperparameter, which is our batch size. That's uh, for those of you who have already uh, programmed in PyTorch. You, you have probably have uh, played with that hyperparameter quite a lot. Well, some tips. Normally, this number is uh, a power of 2. Uh, that is related to how your matrices get uh, structured in the GPU. So having mini batches of, that are powers of 2 helps feeding the, them on the GPU. That's why it's a power of two. Uh, the size also has to be good enough for your hardware. And I'm sure we're going to face this problem in your final project. So most of the papers you're probably reading have been uh, developed in a large data set regime. And there, if you go to the experimental setup, of the paper, sometimes they actually dis discuss what hardware they use to train their models and how long it took. So it's very common to see how we use two or four GPUs and it took four or five days. All right. Uh, so you're going to see how challenging it is to actually feed a data set in memory when you start working with this large data set. And then just as kind of a way to get started, a good way to pick your batch size is just pick a power of two that fits in your memory. Okay? And if you're programming PyTorch and you try to put a large number and it doesn't fit, you're going to get an error saying, like, you ran out of memory and you can't fit that batch here. So you're going to have to decrease that and pick the one that really works for you. Okay? So examples are, at least, for us morals that don't have access to gigantic GPUs, normally, for example, in my PhD, I, I used like batch size of 32 max because I didn't have, uh, like, I only had access to one really good GP GPU at that at that time, but I, I couldn't have multiple. So and that did the job for me at that time. Okay, so now. We're going to talk about uh, another idea that doesn't have to do with batches. It has to do uh, with how to actually uh, compute the gradients. And uh, I'm going to talk about this idea, which is gradient descent with momentum. But before we talk about that, we need some theory. 
it's, hopefully it's not going to be very hard. But we need to talk about moving averages because, oh, average, sorry, it's a typo there. We need to talk about how to compute averages in time series. So a time series is a data set that is organized in time. Think about temperature, for instance, right? This figure here shows the months of the year and some samples of temperatures. So theta one, for example, there might be that first data point there. It's a day in January that is 20 Celsius. Uh, then you have another sample a little bit further, still maybe in the summer, so 23 and then 32. When you get to, uh, like in the middle of the, the year here, you're gonna get lower temperatures, right? And, and then at the end, you get higher temperatures again, the summer starts again, right, for us in the southern hemisphere. So, if you wanna compute the average uh, temperature in this kind of scenarios, right? And remember, you, we might be doing this for prediction, predicting the temperature during the year. So we might be in July and we don't have the data points after July. So we wanna compute the, what we call this moving average, which is as I keep adding samples to my data set, I wanna compute this average as I go or as time passes, okay? So the simplest way to do that is the simple moving average, which I just pick a, a size T of a window, so we can think of this of a window, um, or maybe the last, in this case would be like last um, 30 days, let's say if t is equal 30. So I'm gonna compute the average using the 30 previous examples. This is the easiest way to do that. <clears throat> Another approach is called weighted moving average, which is probably what you expect, and you associate a weight to each sample, we still pick a window size t, and then you just compute the average over that previous t samples. But now giving a weight to each of these samples. Maybe you're gonna, in this case, most likely you're gonna give lower weights to temperatures that are um, earlier in time, right? Maybe you're gonna give more weights to temperatures that are closer to the current day, or the, the latest, the latest samples. And because that's normally the case, there is this um, idea called exponential moving average, which kind of does that, what I just said for us. It gives, it, it allows you to give, or to balance the weight you give to the current sample versus the previous samples you got. So here this formula is, you can read this, VT is the current average that I have. And now I have a parameter beta that is a number between one and zero. And this is the weight I wanna put in my previous average, Vt minus one. So I'm gonna keep an average that is updated every time step. You can think of this starting at V0, right? Maybe, and then you're gonna compute V1 from V0 plus the current sample theta t, right? So think about this. I'm receiving samples in time. Maybe I have theta 1 and then theta 2 and then theta 3, right? This is day 1. You can think about it in days, right? Day 1, day 2, day 3. So every day I want to compute, I want to compute a V T, which is a, um, an average, V0, V1, oh, sorry, v, V1, V2, and V3. And you can, you can consider that V0 is zero, for instance. Okay. So to compute V1, I'm gonna sum the previous mean, or the previous, previous average V0, with my current sample T1. This is a temperature Imagine 28. This is another temperature 23. This is another temper temperature 32. So the, my beta parameter there is the weight that I'm going to put uh, on my previous average, or how much weight I want to how much I want to consider my previous average 
as opposed to my current sample. Okay? And that's, that's the idea. And you can do this every day. And every day you're going to get what we call a moving average that is going to consider the day before and the current sample. Okay, let's see, let's see how this um, develops. So here is our formula. Let's consider beta equals to 0 0.9. Okay? So our V1 would be computed this way, 0 0.9 times V0 plus 0 0.1 uh, theta 1. Okay? And then V2 would be, as you expect, 0 0.9 times V1 plus 0 0.1 times theta 2, and so on and so forth. Right? And then to compute this, um, these averages, now you just have to pick an initial, initial value for V0, and then you can compute them one by one. You start with V0, maybe 0. Then you get 0 0.9 times 0 plus 0 0.1 times 28. That gives you a V1. And then you compute V2 and V3 and so on and so forth. Is it clear? OK. What is cool about this uh, formulation of, or exponential moving average is that you can think about VT as approximately the average of the last 1 over 1 minus beta samples. What do I mean by that? If you pick your beta equals to 0 0.9, you can think that you are averaging over the previous 10 days. Or the ten, in this case, it's days because you're talking about days in the, in, uh, in the year. But it would be 10 previous samples. Okay? And you would get a curve that looks a little bit like this. Okay? <clears throat> you are averaging over the last the, the 10 previous examples. If you change it to 9.8, now you're going to be averaging over the last 50 days. And you're going to get this shifted curve to the right. Because now uh, you're going to take, remember that beta is the term that puts weights on your previous averages. So if this, this number is high, you're going to consider more of your previous averages than the new sample. So you're going to have a delay. So your, your average curve is going to delay to update to the samples. So that's, how, that's why you see this shift over time. Okay? And on the other side of the spectrum, if you pick a lower beta, let's say 0 0.5, you would average um, over the last two days. So now your average is going to almost memorize the your new samples. So now you have um, a good balance between, if you think about 0 0.5, it would be the middle point, right, in terms of weights. But the effect you get, you get a curve that tries to follow the points more uh, directly. So in the, extreme, in the extreme scenario, when your beta is very, very low, 0 0.001, your curve is going to actually hit every point. You won't be actually computing the mean anymore. You're going to be memorizing the points. You're going to get the same points uh, as, as, you, as you read them. Because if, if, beta, if beta is 0, your formula becomes just theta t, right? in the extreme side. If, if beta is 0, vt minus 1 is completely forgotten, and I am only reading the samples, theta 1 theta 2, theta 3. On the other side, if beta is 1, then I'm only looking at the previous average. I'm not considering any new samples. So I need to pick a number in between. You're going to take some, maybe you're going to take some time to convince yourself that this is the curves. OK? So, so to give you a better understanding, I made a collab here. And I'm going to put it. For you, there is actually more going on here. I, oh yeah, this has, so there is two sections in this collab. This, uh, this first one is just a code to generate 
the learning curves of this slide here. Yeah, so this slide here, this code here generates, it's a multi-layer perception with two layer, uh, with one hidden layer only. And here I train it with uh, batch gradient descent and mini batch gradient descent. And then that gives, gives me the, that those two curves there. You can run this to, to check your understanding. Uh, there's a bunch of print statements. Yeah, they're here. And here is a section about exponential moving averages that generate a data set of temperatures similar, similarly to what I was trying to convey here. So instead of picking a, <clears throat> some arbitrary numbers here, I actually generated some data and uh, here's a function, I wrote a function to compute the exponentially moving average, so EMA. Here's the beta parameter. Here you can see the EMA formula, right? Beta times VT plus one minus beta times data points T. And obviously I got a, an error. Uh, oh, because I didn't import maybe the, the previous things. Yeah, there you go. So this is um, a synthetic data set of temperatures for a country in the southern hemisphere. It has that same shape that we saw on the slides. And here is the three, three curves representing moving averages with different values of beta. So the blue one is beta equals 0 0.5, and you see that is more jagged. It's trying to follow the points more closely. The orange one is beta equals to 0 0.9, which is this more smoother cur curve. And green, the green one is that shifted. It's also like it follows the same kind of pattern of the, the orange one, but it's shifted to the right. Okay, so if you want, we can play with these beta values and see how this affects the curves and try to understand what's going on in here. Okay, and I wanted to notice that these numbers, the moving average in the beginning is pretty bad, right? Because we're starting V0 with zero, so that starts your curve with a really bad prediction in the beginning, and there's a way to solve that problem. Well, the higher, and finally the higher the beta, the slower the average adapts uh, to the new samples, okay? As you can see here. I didn't want to show the, that slide right away, but maybe I'll have to show because we don't have much time to do this math by hand. Okay, ideally we would do this, but let's cut corners. The, this formula is called exponentially, or exponential moving average, because as you can see here at the bottom, if you, develop this uh, or unfold, that's the word I was looking for. If you unfold this um, series of computations, you're gonna get this exponentially increasing weights, okay? So think about this for a minute. That's our formula Vt uh, equal to beta Vt minus one plus one minus beta theta t. That's the formula of the exponentially moving average. Let's assume beta equals to 0 0.9. Then you're gonna have v, V100, let's say we're gonna have from V100 to V1. We're going now backwards. So V100 is equal to 0 0.9 V99 plus 0 0.1 uh, theta 100, right? And then you get V99 and V98, all computed based on the previous Vs. But now let's unfold the V100 calculation, right? V100, just copy from, uh, from the top, but the, the, the terms are flipped here, right? So, 0 0.1 theta 100 now is on the left side plus 0 0.9 uh, V99. This is equal to, if I substitute V99 here, right, just uh, grabbing the values right, on, on the second equation there, then I can plug the definition of v, V99 uh, on the second line here, and then I get 0 0.1 theta 100 plus 0 0.9 uh, 
times 0 0.1 theta 99 now plus uh, 0 0.9 V98. And now I can substitute V98 again by that definition up there. Right? And this is enough to show that now if you distribute these values, we're going to get well, the second term of the sum would be 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 to the power of 1 times theta 99. So the 99th sample is weighted by uh, the factor of 1 in the exponent plus 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 over 2, oh, to the power of 2 times theta 98. So the 98th sample is average uh, to the power of 2, and so on and so forth. The 97th would be weighted to the power of 3, and so on and so forth. So that's why this formula is called exponential moving average, because it weights the samples exponentially uh, as time goes. Okay. <clears throat> and it's important to understand this, because this is a very useful idea when you're dealing with time series. Okay. It's a way to kind of exponentially decrease the weight of your previous samples. OK, there's some weird thing. So quickly here, there is this uh, idea that solves that problem I showed you before. So in this previous run here, I showed you that in the beginning of the exponentially moving average, this, the predictions are really bad. Because I don't have a good value to start v0. So if I start v0, then the first predictions will be really bad. And then eventually it's going to catch up, and then you're going to get uh, a realistic average. And there is a way to solve that. And this method is called bias correction. Okay? This term's bias here that has nothing to do with the bias of, of our neural network. Again, I'm talking about these ideas come from uh, statistics. right? Uh, and, and, but what bias correction here means is I want to solve this problem of having bad estimates in the beginning of my series. And the basic idea here is dividing that formula by 1 minus beta to the t. And I can, I'm showing here in the slides that if you start with 0, with 0, so this is our original formula here in magenta or pink. We would develop this now, uh, these equations, v0 and v0, then v1 and v2 would be these, uh, as you see in the slides. Okay? So see how v2 would be 0 0.001968 times theta 1 plus 0 0.02 theta 2. But if you get 20 th 28 times this number and then 24 times this number, you're going to get a number that is very low. It doesn't capture what's going on here. So you start with 10, 28, but you're predicting for the first day 0 0.56, which would be very low here. But eventually, as you, as you move in time, these Vs are going to catch up. They're going to actually go back to here, as you saw on the collab. But the way you're going to solve that issue, so you're going to get a curve like this. Okay? Eventually, over time, this uh, curve is going to catch up and actually start representing the data. But instead, if you use this idea of bias correction, you keep your formula the way it was. You just divide it by 1 minus beta to the t. And what that will do is I'm just reproducing those calculations um, for v2. Right? So I'm just copying and, and reproducing the same thing here, but now dividing by 1 minus beta to the, uh, to the t for v2. What you're going to get is. Uh, exactly this, right? 0 0.00196 T1 plus 0 0.02 theta 2 over 0 0.0396. Okay? And essentially, what this is doing is making an weighted average uh, over time. Okay? And what you're going to get if you use this formulation is V1 equals to 28, which is exactly uh, the, the first sample, and V2 will be roughly 13, OK? So you're going to get a curve that is more like the, the curve you would expect. So it's a way to deal with these problems of 
how do you start a moving average, um, you can use this bias correction. And you, you can check that here as well on the same collab. I have the same function now to compute the moving average but using bias correction. And what you're gonna get is in fact, you won't see those three curves starting from zero anymore. They will actually start uh, as you would expect from your data samples. Okay. Again, this is fundamental to understand uh, gradient descent with momentum. <clears throat> so if we run mini batch gradient descent, we would get updates like this. Okay. Visually, I hope you, what we wanted, ideally what we wanted to do is this, right? But we can't because we cannot fit the entire data set in memory, so you're gonna have to somehow, or figure out a way to do something like this or to approximate this uh, learning steps in a, maybe a more clever, a more clever optimization algorithm. And the, the answer to that is using exponentially weighted moving average, okay? And that's what gradient descent with momentum does. But, so I'm gonna just put JD with momentum. So the, the way this algorithm works is you just compute the partial derivatives using the backward, using backward pass or using your normal back propagation algorithm, but now on xt, right? Here is the partial derivative of uh, L with respect to W and with respect to B. So now I'm gonna do a exponential moving average on the gradient. And I'm gonna use the exponential moving formula here. I'm gonna call this V D W, V from the exponential moving average. This would be equal to beta from exponential moving average times V D W plus one minus beta dw. So dw is the previous gradient, is my sample, and vdw is my current moving average of the gradient. And I'm going to do the same for my bias term, or weight, vdb plus 1 minus beta db. And I'm gonna update now my, mat my W matrix or each L matrix here using the gradient descent update rule, but now I'm gonna use VDW here for W and the same for minus, same for bias weight, minus alpha v d b. So essentially the gradient with momentum just uses, just computes the exponential moving average of the gradient. And you can, and the beta term is a hyperparameter of the algorithm, okay? Let me see how you, oh, and maybe I, now it's a good time to show the slides. <clears throat> so the updates in green are the updates from mini batch gradient descent. Gradient descent with momentum, here I'm also computing it 
on the mini batches, okay? Because again, remember that on mini batch gradient descent, you get this approximate gradients. And we, what we're trying to do here, what gradient descent does with momentum, sorry, is it, it gives you the average of the gradients, which ends up, and think about this, right? The, the average between these two points is a point in the middle here. And the average between these two, just these two points is another point here, right? And so on and so forth. So you'd get the middle points between those uh, consecutive green ones, and, and that would make your learning much faster. Right? You, again, you can think of this as the, the vertical, another way of thinking about this uh, is imagine just, imagine just um, uh, two weights, B and, and, and W. What you actually want is you want a low learning rate on the, the, vert, the vertical axis and a fast learning on the horizontal axis. So what, what gradient descent of momentum is doing is essentially computing the average. And you get an average closer to zero on the vertical axis, okay? Okay, so let's talk about another similar idea. And because you're running out of time, I'm gonna just show you the math right away and gonna keep this on the board. Actually, this might be a good idea. There's another algorithm called root mean square propagation, or MSProp, um, which is very similar to gradient descent with momentum. You can think of these as two different ideas that do the same thing. They're not built on top of each other. Maybe they're do different ideas that do the same thing. They look very similar. So RMS prop still computes the, the, the gradients um, with the backpropagation algorithm on the XT mini batch here. And it still uses the moving average. Now I'm calling the moving average SDW and SDB because uh, we're gonna combine these two in a minute. But here you also have a beta times your previous uh, average which is SDW, and then one minus beta. Now notice that I'm squaring, I'm squaring DW, right? And same for DB. That's the, one of the, the main differences. And when I'm updating W and B, instead of updating with uh, the, the averages SDW and SDB, I'm dividing the gradients DW and DB by the square root of their averages. But now I'm squaring the samples here every time, okay? And what we wanted to attempt, what this is trying to do is essentially the same idea. I want to keep a slow run learning rate on the vertical axis and a fast learning rate on the horizontal axis. So the gradient here would be a small expected value for DW and would be large for DB. So if I square these, these values and then take their, divide by their, their square roots later, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide DW by a, a small number, right? So that's gonna make DW larger uh, that's what I want. I want a fast learning rate on the horizontal axis. So this dividing by the square root of SDW here is just um, stretching or making my, my uh, learning rate faster on the, oh, sorry, on the horizontal axis. And the opposite for the B, which I'm dividing by a large number now, and it's then decreasing dB, so I am making my learning rate slower on the vertical axis, okay? <clears throat> I'm gonna now finish, finally, the Adam algorithm combines RMS prop and gradient descent with momentum, okay? So we're gonna compute VDW and VDB 
using the momentum formulation, right? Exponential moving average of the gradient, VDW and VDB. You're going to compute also SDW and SDB, which are the uh, exponential moving averages of RMS prop, but now it's squared uh, or squaring the, the gradients DW and DB. And finally, it all comes together here because Adam uses bias correction uh, to fix the initial estimates of the gradient. So when you see here this VDW and VDB being divided by 1 minus beta uh, over uh, to the T, that's the bias correction uh, applied to VDW and VDB. And I'm going to apply bias correction also for the RMS prop terms, SDW and SDB. And finally, my updates W and B are going to be w equals, w equals to W minus alpha, the learning rate, multiplied by VDW over square root of SDW. Okay? So VDW is the term from momentum, and the square of SDW comes from RMS prop, sorry. And the same for the bias term. Okay? Notice how now we also have two betas, one for each uh, pair of terms. We have one beta one for momentum and beta two for RMS prop. And they have uh, values that are normally really work well. So the authors of this um, algorithm, they did a study and they showed that these values, B, B, beta 1 equals to 0 0.9 and beta 2 equals to 0 0.999 are actually really good uh, values for these two parameters. So that's normally the default values we, we all use. Okay. Um, any final questions? Okay, this was my last slide. Next Monday, or this Monday, we're going to talk about, we're going to have the midterm, and then on Wednesday, we're going to start about, talk about convolutional neural nets. So finally, we have finished these last three lectures, we finished talking about improving neural networks. Okay? Now you have seen the most recent common techniques for training neural networks, including how to split data sets, how to evaluate either regression or classification problems, you know how to, to train a multilayer perception. Um, you know about back propagation, how to compute the gradients. And you know how to optimize these uh, algorithms uh, really well for large data sets. Okay? So starting from next week on Wednesday, we're going to move and start talking about different types of architectures. And we're going to see how we can process images, images much faster with convolutional neural networks. All right, thank you.